Welcome to Mysteries of Superstition Mountain. I'm Larry Hedrick, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today we have another great story by Hank Sheffer. The Arizona Territory, in turn with the Superstition Mountain region, holds a winning hand of cards when it comes to discussing the topic of Western expansion. Arizona has it all, from its cool mountains with lush timber, rivers and streams for livestock, and fields with open range for grazing. And above all, there was new unspoiled land to be had to start a new life away from the hell left by the Civil War. Whatever the reasons for coming here, Arizona held all the aces. To begin our story, uh, we must really look at the declining cattle business in Texas. That decline was stimulated uh, the tremendous growth in Arizona territory during the 1880s, and that very much included the Superstition Mountains. Some 10 years earlier, a lush green valley in the Sierra Ansas had been discovered. The Sierra Ansas, for those who don't know, is a mountain range in Gila County that lies between Roosevelt Lake to the south, the Tonto Basin to the west, Cherry Creek to the east, and Pleasant Valley to the north. Now, if you haven't guessed, that's where we're headed. We're headed to the Pleasant Valley War in this story. This valley was supplied with water mainly by Cherry Creek and Tonto Creek. It became a haven for new settlers. And unfortunately, tagging along were the ever-present rustlers and unsavvy characters. This lush area came to be known as Pleasant Valley. Now, one of the first to be there, if not the first, was James Stinson. Uh, he was a cattleman to settle in Pleasant Valley in 1880, and he brought his cattle and people with him. That year saw the insurgence of many more cattlemen, and John Dunning Tewksbury was one of them. Bostonian raised Tewksbury wandered into Arizona sometime around 1877. Before leaving Oregon, J.D. had prosperously bred and raced fine horses. He was a wealthy, solid citizen. He really didn't need to make the move because he had all the money he needed. However, as with so many others, he got that itch that needed scratching. He had to move, had to go the wanderlust route. He cashed out in Oregon, packed up his family, and began seeking that elusive whatever it was that would satisfy that itch. It is believed that J.D. got his first glimpse of the Lost Pleasant Valley from up on the Mogollon Rim while following a herd of stolen cattle, of all things. Sometime after the death of his Shoshone wife, Tewksbury married an Englishwoman on November 6, 1879. Lydia Ann Krieger Schultes was a cattle owner in Tempe, Arizona. A short time later, he and Lydia, along with his five children from his prior marriage, John Jr., Edwin, James, Frank, and a daughter, Elvira, relocated to Pleasant Valley on the east side of Cherry Creek. Now, the Graham brothers, on the other hand, Tom and John, came into the area and settled on the west side of Cherry Creek roughly 10 miles to the north of where the Tewksbury's were located. They were later joined by their half-brother, Billy. Ironically, both the Grams and the Tewksbury's rode for the Stinson outfit their first three years in the valley. So they were all together, Stinson, Tewksbury, and the Graham brothers. It was about this time that things were about to change for the worst. None of the future war participants were aware of the impending problems that would eventually raise their ugly heads. Well, now, this is the part where things really start getting crazy. Both the Grams and the Tewksbury's began stealing cattle from their employer, James Stinson, to build up their own herds. It took a lot of manpower to run the Stinson outfit because his herd was ever-growing. 
course, the newcomers were stealing cattle as quickly as he was replacing them. So it didn't take long for Stinson to finally say, enough is enough. In 1882 and 83, Stinson brought charges of cattle rustling against Bill and Tom Graham. In 1884, he again accused the Grahams of rustling. That same year, Stinson charged the three Tewksburys, Edwin, James, and John, along with George Blaine, Bill Richards, and W.H. Bishop, was stealing a hundred head of his cattle. The actions all went to court. Every instance they went to court. Unfortunately for Stinson, all of the accused were acquitted. Nobody went to jail, and Stinson wound up the only loser. There was no love lost between the bunch of thieves, as it turns out, either. The Grahams hated the three oldest Tewksbury boys and made no secret about how they felt about the Shoshone half-breeds. On top of all that, it was rumored that the Graham boys had been chasing after John Jr.'s pretty wife. That did not set well either. All that said, there was only one thing the Tewksbury's and the Grahams really had in common. They both hated sheep with a passion. Unbeknownst to them, at least not yet anyway, that ingredients was soon to be added to the already heating up Arizona cattleman's stew pot. Make no mistake, the woolly critters would bring that pot to a full boil. It must be noted here that the introduction of sheep and fences to the grazing land in Texas were the two major reasons that the Texans had moved to Arizona territory in the first place. The doggone sure didn't need or want that same woolly problem again. For example, in 1881, that, that problem of the woolly critters we talked about, a cattleman by the name of D.A. Stanford foreclosed on a ranch near Tucson. The ranch had been owned by Thule, Ocha, and DeLong, and showed flocks numbering over 13,000 head of sheep. Stanford soon realized the potential of the copious amounts of dinero that he could make with those sheep. He told his foreman, John Cady, to sell off all his cattle stock and move the sheep onto this rangeland. This turned out to be a very profitable move. But it had its drawbacks. Owning sheep was dangerous and could get a man dead real quick. In 1884, the Aztec Land and Cattle Company Limited brought its hash knife cowboys and cattle into the Arizona Territory. It was a New York corporation comprised of investors and speculators, including railroad tycoons and wealthy businessmen who didn't know much about cattle. But by golly, they sure did know a bunch about business. By purchasing one million alternating sections of land from the railroad, they effectively tied up more than two million acres for their own use. The land extended from Mormon Lake to east of Holbrook and from the Little Colorado River south to the Mogollon Rim. This is a big hunk of dirt, people. This surly bunch of hash knife wranglers were well known for their unscrupulous methods that they used to keep settlers from crossing hash knife land to reach the sections that were legally still open for settlement. They raised havoc with the homesteaders and the squatters, every one. Herders on the Little Colorado River lost over 4,000 head with irate cattlemen ran their sheep into the river. North of Flagstaff, 10 bands of sheep near the San Francisco peaks were mangled when a herd of horses were stampeded through their midst. Uh, a band of sheep is 2,500 sheep, so times 10, that's 25,000 sheep that were destroyed. William C. Barnes, a cattleman, told a story of a herder who had his sheep run off in 1883. Along with everything else, the herder was to be hung. The sentence of hanging was commuted, though, to having his ears notched instead. Oh, good. The shepherd lived and two years later sued the cattleman for his indignation. He received a $10,000 settlement 
and disappeared, never to be heard from again. Uh, he could have cared less about them sheep anymore, but he just got his money and he left. I suppose the point to be made here again is that while there was money to be made with the woolly critters, they were also a very dangerous, if not expedient, way to get yourself killed, as they used to say. In the meantime, serious malcontent continued to escalate between the Tewksbury's and the Grahams, and of course James Stinson. That pot we talked about earlier was just about to come to a full boil. The inevitable was able to be set into play. Here's what happened. James Stinson ordered his foreman, John Gilliland, to round up whatever strays he had not gathered as yet. And in the process, Gilliland encountered Ed Tewksbury and some of his cowboys. Bad words were thrown back and forth. I'm sure they probably accused each other of rustling. And this, of course, caused the Tewksbury's to retaliate with the law of the range gunfire. The foreman, Gilliland, was sent on his way with a bullet to his leg. Obviously, the time for talking had come to an abrupt halt. Well, now, timing notwithstanding, now we see the entrance of the affluent, very powerful Dag brothers, originally from Missouri. There is much to be said about their influence, probably the largest influence in the causes of the feud to start with. They were five brothers, all of whom had money, and they were looking for control and ways to make even more money. They controlled more than 50,000 head of sheep, and they approached the Tewksbury's with a proposition that would not set well with anybody else. The DAG suggested that a large flock of sheep would offer not only the opportunity for the Tewksbury's to make a profit with their land, but also allow a further retaliation against the Grams by running the cattle business out of the area below the Mogollon Rim. Well, now, cattlemen and sheepmen don't mix. I really probably don't need to tell you that, but there are some important elements that need to be considered when talking about the seemingly inherent hate between cattlemen and the sheepmen. Aside from the fact that sheep could nibble the grazing land down to dirt and the cattle wouldn't have anything left to graze on, there were a few other elements that existed. It really didn't have anything to do with the cattle or the sheep. Cowboys had been the cock of the roost for so many years. They had their own distinctive dress, spurs, high boots, chaps, wide sombrero style hats. They ruled the world from the back of a horse and lorded it over everybody else, as well as the nasty cow critters and any other beast, including man. Cowboys and cattle supplied the demand of beef for the ever-growing population of the country from coast to coast. In their own eyes, cowboys were a real big deal. On the other hand, sheepmen were notoriously from foreign countries. They spoke and dressed funny, as far as the cowboy was concerned. And of all the sanctimonious things to do, one shepherd could handle vast numbers of sheep and he did it on foot with only the aid of a couple smart dogs that would help him rouse them sheep around. And what was worse, while the sheep could be sold for food, they could also be sold for their very valuable commodity, wool. In fact, at times wool was in greater demand than the mutton was. In essence, sheep returned 100% of every dollar that was invested. This kind of ran the cattle people a little bit on the crazy side. The investment and return were the reasons that made sheep appear so appealing to the Tewksbury's. The Dag brothers agreed to send a band of sheep into Pleasant Valley under the protection of the Tewksbury guns. The three brothers and Bill Jacobs would sit, receive a share of the profits just for the use of their guns. It was a dangerous scheme at best one that might wipe them out if it failed. 
it would wipe out everybody if it failed. But if anyone in Arizona could carry it off, those three half-breed brothers could turn the trick. There still wasn't any love lost. The Grams didn't like these boys. The bargain was struck. The Tewksbury's, or the Dags, hired a Nav Navajo shepherd. We're not real sure which of them hired the shepherd. But unfortunately, not so good for the shepherd, he was murdered in the following February in 1887. While the Grams were never proven to have committed the crime, it was rumored that Andy Cooper, a name you want to remember, in league with the Grams was responsible for the deed. Others say it was the cowboys from the hash, the hash knife outfit. Who knows? We don't know and probably never will know. We are probably never going to know for certain who was actually responsible. But what we do know is that whatever the case may have been, all manner, measure, and forms of hell were about to break loose. Now, in 1887, Martin J., or Old Man Blevins, owned a place on Canyon Creek. It was a homeward for wayward rustlers, horse thieves, and other assorted hardcore elements. The leader of this bad bunch was Blevins' son, Andy Cooper. So now you all don't get confused over this. Andy Blevins changed his name to Cooper to avoid being caught for his many infractions of the law. Of course, everybody on the planet knew that Andy Cooper was Andy Blevins, so it really didn't matter. But he went by Andy Cooper, and he died by that name. We'll get to that in a few minutes. At any rate, a prime example of that hell that took place occurred during the summer when old Mark Blevins became the second casualty of the Pleasant Valley War. Here's how that story went. Mark Blevins was out searching for horses when he just up and disappeared. On the third day of August in 1887, a group of cowboys, including hands from the Hash Knife and Graham Ranches, Bob Gillespie, Bob Carrington and Tom Tucker, along with Hamp Blevins, the youngest brother, and John Payne, joined up to search for the old man. They searched for three weeks and found no signs of him anywhere. But now the group of frustrated searchers were getting to the point where they couldn't find him. They were frustrated over that. And so what they did was they started building an even deeper contempt for the Tewksbury's. Whether true or not, they had talked themselves into believing the Tewksbury's had to be responsible for the old man's disappearance. Unfortunately, the search party had become little more than just a gang of guys on the prod. They were looking for somebody to blame, and the Tewksbury's filled the bill. Their search eventually took them over to Wilson Creek. That Wilson Creek has had other different names, like Walnut Creek, some people get the maps wrong, but we're going to use Wilson Creek for now. That was on the afternoon of Wednesday, the 10th of August. This is when they came upon the Middleton cabin. That cabin turned out to be the nastiest hive of angry bees any of them could have ever imagined. Inside the cabin were Ed Tewksbury, Jim Tewksbury, and James Roberts. As we know, there was no love lost by the Graham brothers for the men inside. Jim Rogers, who had settled below the rim some years before, had lost numerous horses to thieves, and of course, Andy Cooper and his bunch were blamed for those thefts. Nevertheless, here we go, oaths were issued and sworn to by both sides, and then there was an explosion of gunfire. The first volley of fire came from the cabin, and with it, Hamp Blevins was mortally wounded, dead before he hit the ground. A rifle ball issued by Robert clipped off one of John Payne's ears, and another ball dropped his horse out from under him. A second later, Jim Tewksbury shot and killed the poor guy standing there. All he was doing was standing there trying to figure out what was going on, and Jim Tewksbury shot him. In the less time that it takes to tell this story, Bob Carrington was hit twice, once in the right arm and again in the left leg. 
Tom Tucker was hit by a bullet that entered his left side and exited out under his right armpit. Bob Gillespie, trying to get his mount turned around and return fire to the cabin, had received a pistol shot to his pride <laughs> and was knocked unceremoniously off his saddle. Now, I'm thinking I'd have probably gone out of the saddle too. With no further ado, the wounded riders decided that discretion was truly the better part of valor. They hightailed it through a hail of lead as quickly as they could get their animals to move. This go-round clearly went to the Tewksbury brothers and Jim Roberts. However, the ball was truly open at this point. This was war. The brothers were forced into hiding from camp to camp. They knew for certain that Andy Cooper, having just lost two of his kin, would be hot on their trail. The Pleasant Valley War has always been characterized as the Graham Tewksbury feud. But so far, the Graham brothers had not actually played any active roles in the happenstance at all. Other than their loyalties, they felt toward the cattlemen. That was about all that they had done so far. The ruckus that had been raised up so far was between the Hash Knights, Blevins, cattlemen, and the Tewksbury sheepmen. However, that was all soon to take a turn. Again, for even worse than what it was before. Now we have the law dogs getting involved. It's getting a little bit too hot and heavy, so the law dogs are getting involved. Sheriff Bill Malvinon and his posse from Prescott had 10 warrants in their possession, and they had to pick up anybody involved at the Middleton Cabin shootout. In the meantime, Bill Graham was headed for Payson. There he met up with Deputy Sheriff Jim Hawk, or Hoke. As Hoke tells it, he says, I went up on the hill above the trail to the Graham Ranch and picketed my horse and slept out till daylight. Then I got down on the trail behind a tree. I knew John Graham would come along and I had a warrant for him and was going to get him. Instead of John Graham though, Bill Graham came along and I didn't have a warrant for him because he was one of the younger ones. I stepped out and Bill drew a gun on me. I tried to stop him. When I first seen him, it was him. I tried to speak to him, but it was no use. As he pulled his gun, I turned loose and shot him. His horse whirled, and I, sh I shot two or three more times. I knew it was the only thing to do, because he was pumping at me as fast as he could pull the trigger. Well, now Billy Graham, like Carrington, managed to stay on his horse and rode back to the Graham Ranch. There, shortly after his arrival, he died. Sure enough, did. If it had not been officially declared before, the killing of Bill Graham marked the actual beginning of the Pleasant Valley War. When our summer was at an end, when on September 2, 1887, Tom and John Graham, along with Andy Cooper and a band of riders, angrily headed for the Tewksbury headquarters. Regrettably, the mob encountered Bill Jacobs and John Tewksbury just about a mile from their house. The Graham Bunts ambushed the two men, didn't have a chance, and neither one survived. John became the first Tewksbury casualty. Now, there's different versions of the story that say they were within a mile. Some say they were even closer to the house, but we'll get to that in just a minute, too. But just so you don't come after me, uh, there's a whole bunch of different stories that have been told about this war. Well, now, meanwhile, Ed and Jim Tewksbury, their mother and sickly father, were inside the main house. Some people believe that Jim Roberts was also there, but that's never been confirmed, so we don't know if he was or wasn't for sure. Now, according to the one story, the bodies were close to the house. Others say, well, we'll get to that. As with so many events of this nature, even eyewitness accounts can vary greatly. 
One story relates that Bill Jacobs and John Tewksbury were close enough to the house that Mrs. Tewksbury could see hogs rooting at their fallen bodies. She was outraged. She ran outside to bury the men or at least get them away from the hogs. This account says that she was shot dead for her efforts. Other versions, including the accounts of William Croft Barnes, another rancher in the area, and most of the newspaper chronicles uh, that were more reliable stated that the Tewksbury slipped away. They got out the back of the house to safety. Finding no one in the house, there was nobody left, the Graham and Cooper faction also pulled out. They just went home. Justice of the Peace, John Meadows. He was a character, but he was from Payson, and he rode to the Dukesbury Ranch to hold an inquest. There really wasn't much to do other than bury the bodies. There was nobody to talk to, so you really didn't have much of an inquest. Meadows seems to have been pretty complacent about the whole ordeal as well. He hypothecated that given enough time, the two factions would simply wipe each other out, and the killing would have to stop due to lack of participants. Well, personally, the attitude that the situation would resolve itself by running out of combatants was pretty cavalier as far as I'm concerned. There were just too many people who were getting involved, whether they wanted to or not. There's a lot of names that we don't even hear about from the Graham Tewksbury War. So there were lots of people being involved, lots of cattlemen, lots of sheep people. Fortunately, this Graham Tewksbury conflict had not gone unnoticed by higher authorities. Enough was enough, and it was past time to call a halt to the whole bloody affair. A meeting was held on September 7th. 1887. In attendance was Governor C. Mayor Zulick, Sheriff William Malvinon, and District Attorney John C. Herndon. The consensus was that it didn't matter who had started what or when, everyone involved in the conflict in any way was to be arrested and brought before the court, no matter what or how the shooting had to stop. They just had to make it quit. Warrants were issued as early as March 26 of 1886 to arrest Andy Cooper, for Pete's sake. That was a full year before then. He, he was issued warrants for stealing more than 30 horses from the Navajo Indians. Unfortunately, or fortunately, however you want to look at it, Cooper was never arrested simply because no sheriff territorial deputy, U.S. Marshal, or anyone else with a badge considered stealing from Indians a crime that warranted arresting a white man. Now, however, pressure was brought to bear. That pressure was laid upon the shoulders of one Commodore Perry Owens, the Apache County Sheriff. He was there from 1887 to 1888. It came in the form of an ultimatum. It was get Andy Cooper or get another job. He really had no choice in the matter. And he took him up on it and he did what he was told. Well now, Andy Cooper arrived in Hallbrook on September 4th, immediately following the ambush at the Tewksbury Ranch. He boasted that he was the one that had put Jacobs and Tewksbury in the ground and in doing so, to his way of thinking, he had avenged the death of his father and brother. Unfortunately for Cooper, Sheriff Perry Owens arrived in Hallbrook that very same day. The Western gunfight that occurred when Owens moved in for the arrest during that afternoon has gone down in history as nothing short of amazing. As near as we can ascertain, here are the actual movements of both Cooper and Sheriff Owens on that fateful day in September of 1887. Sheriff Owens rode to Brown and Kinder's livery stable at Hallbrook to put up his horse. He then crossed the street to Watron's drugstore where he engaged some of John Blevins' men in a conversation. In the meantime, 
Andy Cooper spotted Owens from inside his mother's house. He told John Blevins, his brother, to go get his horse and put him out front. And so uh, he didn't want the sheriff to see him, but he wanted that horse handy in case he got a chance to get away. Shortly thereafter, Owens returned to the livery stable to get his Winchester. Rifle in hand, he left the livery stable and walked down Main Street toward the Blevins' house. Sheriff Owens approached the front door and called for Cooper to surrender. But with a pistol in his hand behind his back, Cooper answered the door and told Owens that he would be just a moment while he got ready. Well, there's no way that Owens was buying into that bit of fluff. The wary lawman fired through the door and hit Andy Cooper in the stomach. Owens then jumped down off the porch at the same instant that John Blevins fired a shot. That bullet just barely missed the sheriff. At this point, I can recall no greater irony than the fact that the bullet fired by John struck the very horse he had brought around earlier for his brother, thus killing Andy's only means of escape. Even if Cooper had a chance to get away, that four-legged chance had just dropped over dead. Now it was Owen's turn to return fire, again to the front door. This time, John was the recipient of the lead pellet. It struck him in the shoulder. Then Andy Cooper made the last mistake he would make in his young outlaw life. Owen spotted him through a window and with deadly accuracy shot the fugitive in the hips. With all hell breaking loose, Sam Houston Blevins, who was only 15, and he was the youngest brother, picked up the pistol that, that old Andy Cooper had dropped and headed out onto the porch after Owens. He too came up short with a ball from Owens' deadly rifle. He soon died in his mother's arms. In desperation, another of the occupants, Mose Roberts, crawled out through a window on the west side of the house, but Owens heard him. Owen shouldered the Winchester one more time and shot the men in the chest. Though badly wounded, Roberts managed to muster enough strength to get back into the house, where he finally collapsed and was dying in the kitchen. The situation inside the house, as you might imagine, was just sheer pandemonium. Owens, on the other hand, kept his wits about him the entire time. He was cold and calculating under fire. There would be no escape that day. In about a minute, Sheriff Perry Owens walked away from the shootout without a scratch. In his wake, there were three men dead or dying and another wounded. With smoke still hanging in the air, the sheriff calmly returned to the livery stable. He shoved the Winchester back in its scabbard. He mounted and he rode out of Holbrook. However, he did return for a court inquest concerning the September 4th incident two days later. The trial of John Blevins, the only survivor, was delayed for a year, but eventually he was sentenced to five years in jail. Providence was on Blevins' side because he was pardoned shortly thereafter without ever serving one day behind bars. It was entirely different for Andy Cooper Sam Blevins and Mose Roberts. They had already shelled out the highest dole to mark their debt to society paid in full. You could hear sighs of relief as many believed that this gunfight should have put a halt to the deadly feud. Unfortunately, that was not to be the case. On September 16th, only 12 days later, Yet another confrontation erupted. This time it was the Tewksbury brothers and Jim Roberts dueling with Harry Middleton and Joe Underwood. Harry Middleton was shot through and through, but still managed to return to the Graham Ranch where he soon died. Underwood made it over to San Carlos where he, he did recover. Nope, still wasn't over. Also because of the meeting with the governor, Sheriff Mulvernon and a posse of 25 rode into Pleasant Valley four days after that and convened at the Perkins store. 
To describe the situation location a little bit, this store lo was located just a short distance from the Graham house. Oddly enough, it was surrounded by a stone wall. The next day, John Graham and Charlie Blevins rode to the store and were met by a Congress comprised of the sheriff and his deputies. The posse had been put down behind the wall, and they stayed hidden behind the wall while Sheriff Maul Vernon gave the order for the two men to surrender. In another incredibly stupid move, the two outlaws chose to resist the order. Sheriff Maul Vernon shotgun dropped Graham's horse right out from under him. That shotgun blast also cued a volley of gunfire from the barricaded posse. Both outlaws were killed instantly. Stupidity went out. The sheriff then proceeded to the Graham house where he arrested Miguel Apicado, and nearby the Graham house stood a cabin where another Confederate, Al Rose, was also arrested, as were the Tewksbury's, Jim Roberts, and four of their cohorts. Tom Graham was not captured at that time, but turned himself in a little later in uh, October. The prisoners were all taken to Prescott where to everyone's surprise, they were all either discharged or released on bail. A grand jury hearing was set for the end of the year in December of 1887. Well, that December rolled around when an even bigger surprise took place. All of the principals actually showed up. Oh, they were armed to the teeth, however, um, but they did show up. Happily, nothing came of it, and the proceedings continued. Edwin, Jim Tewksbury, and Jim Roberts, and the four other defendants were all indicted for the murder of Hemp Blevins. The Grahams were scheduled to appear in court at the Apache County seat in St. John's. The trial dates were set for six months later in June of 1888. In their case, however, not so surprisingly, out of fear, none of the witnesses showed up to give testimony. The court was forced to release all the defendants due to lack of evidence. That was a sorry situation. According to William C. Barnes, a man who became a very prominent cattleman up in that area in uh, Pleasant Valley, Jim Tooks. Barry became increasingly ill with consumption after the trials. He died in Prescott before the year was out. That left only two survivors from the original two feuding families, Edwin Tewksbury and Tom Graham. The following year, Tom Graham and his new wife moved to Tempe. Ed Tewksbury stayed in Pleasant Valley, but he never ran cheap again. To everyone's relief, it seemed as though the terrible fighting had finally come to an end. However, there was one last scene to be played out, but it would not occur until several years later in 1892. Tom Graham and his family were still living in Tempe. However, on August 2nd, 1892, he was shot in the back while making some deliveries and he was shot from ambush. Before he died two hours later, he testified that it was Edwin Tewksbury who had pulled the trigger. Witnesses who heard the fatal shot reported seeing a rider who looked like Edwin Tewksbury. All the evidence was substantial enough to support his arrest three days later. The last Tewksbury was taken to trial in Tucson, Arizona where he was found guilty and sent to jail. But then, in February 1895, Tewksbury was released. They got him a new trial, which was scheduled for March of 1896. At that trial, after so many years, Edwin Tewksbury was acquitted and all charges were dropped. He moved to Globe, Arizona, where he served as a law enforcement officer he remarried and had four children. 
In the end, he died in his home in 1904 from a stroke resulting from pneumonia. He was 45 years old. There is no doubt that the story of the Pleasant Valley War, sometimes called the Tonto Basin Feud or Tonto Basin War, or even the Tewksbury Graham Feud, this was a range war fought in Pleasant Valley, Arizona, in the years 1882 to 1892, and was the longest and bloodiest range war in American history. It is truly an incredible tale. That area right now has, a, has another name to it, and that's Young, call it Young, dash Pleasant Valley. I have to say that I've only touched some of the high points with this go around simply because of the complexity of everything that was taking place at the time. Do know that there is much more to be discovered about this conflict should you spend any time at all up on the web researching the topic. You will find information about the people mentioned and the fascinating roles they continue to play in Arizona history. Long after the gunfight quit and the smoke drifted off, these people were still making history. You will also discover numerous other people who became involved, whether by choice or otherwise. Some were local vigilantes or hired hands and cowboys from both sides. In total, over 35 to 50 individuals were killed. Today, many of their graves can still be seen up at the Young Cemetery. As for the Perkins store, well, it still stands as a museum. It's still there. The uh, Pleasant Valley area was renamed Young in 1890. I should have mentioned that earlier. In closing this segment, while we can definitively say that Edwin Tewksbury was the last survivor of the Pleasant Valley War, and we also know that he died in Globe, Arizona in April of 1904, there is much more about this war that we cannot say. It can also be said that the final analysis, perhaps just as the Peace Meadows had been right all along, with no more Grams and no more Tewksbury's left, the war finally had to come to an end. And it did. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. 